Well, I would like to respectfully oppose one thing you just said, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. Okay, so you said that, um, and I, for the most part, I agree with you, that there is no necessary um, specific on being a conservative, but one that I would say that there is a slight template for or a foundation for is being pro-life, which I am. Um, mm. And I saw your video and I actually shared it on my, on my Facebook page and on my Twitter because your video about it um, in terms of five-ish months onwards was really genuine and really good and full of facts and I loved that and I was like, she's, she's speaking out for it. But in terms of, of the issue itself, I'm pretty hard line on it. Mm. How do you feel about abortion, generally speaking, not the New York laws, but just generally? I don't like it. Okay. Um, I don't like it. I think it's um, I think it's appallingly sad um, mm. that it happens. I, I, in some situations, it's sadly unavo sadly unavoidable. I mean, oh, of course, ectopic. I, yeah. um, ectopic, for instance. But the thing, it's interesting though. Um, and a and I was listening to some interview. And I've read it. I was reading a bit about this as well. And abortion. Yeah, yeah, oh, she's pure ceramic. But an abortion, the pre procedure of an abortion specifically is going in with the intent to terminate the life of the fetus. Of your baby. So, yeah, yeah, of the baby, yeah. So um, in a case, say, where a mother is unwell or there's an emergency with a pregnancy, um, the doctors go in with the intention of saving both mother and baby. Yes. If there is a choice to be made, then the baby is the one that sacrifices is sacrificed. Unfortunately, because the mother is well, already sentient, and a, yes. you know, if you have to, it's a bit medieval to sacrifice the mother for the baby. We've moved on a bit from that concept as a society. Um, but they go in with the intention of saving both. So the resulting death of the the baby is not the result of an abortion per se. It's an unhappy byproduct of whatever procedure is going on. Sure. Whereas if you're going in um, and actually, you know, you know how abortions are done. You know, the I first time, the second. Yeah, it, 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 it made me cry. Uh, yeah. Yeah, makes me sick. It's yeah. awful. It's awful. Mm. Um, an abortion is when you go in specifically with the only intention to terminate the pregnancy. So an, an ectopic, for instance, isn't an abortion because you have to you have to get rid of an ectopic because the, they can kill you. Yeah, they'll kill you. They'll clog you. Yeah. They'll clog you. They, they, that is a, a very horrible thing to have happen. Um, but in terms of abortion, generally, I mean, I mean, I really had Down to. Down syndrome is an argument. Rape is another argument. Yeah, um, but they're, they're this much of abortions, though, that's the it's thing. A, like, it's less than 3% of rape. And um, in, in some countries, uh, Down syndrome, it's it's pretty high to, to turn I, a Down syndrome person. I have a feeling, and me. whoever's watching can look this up, but I remember reading that in the UK, about 98% of Down syndrome pregnancies are aborted. Mm. And I, I don't agree with that at all because, I, I mean, people with Downs, um, there's a spectrum of Downs, obviously. Oh, but of people course, with of Yeah, but gen they, they can live really productive, fulfilling, happy lives and form relationships and make friends and have jobs, you it's know. It's pure convenience and selfishness yeah. of the parent that that, yeah. that that child is terminated. Yeah, and the the Downs Downs babies that they're, they're, they're so sweet. Like people with Down syndrome. I mean, my my old workplace is when I had a day job um, I still do. years ago. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It's nothing wrong with having a day job. But no, we had well, a lady. People want to do this, but yeah, keep going. No, it's it's okay. You've got to, you know, it's a step by step process. Trust me, you'll you'll get there. You'll be fine. <laughs> but we had a lady um, with Down syndrome who used to come in and do one shift a week, and it was you know very easy work. She had the most basic sort of part of the job, but she got everything done. She did a three hour shift. She paid her taxes. You know, she she socialized with us, and then off she went. You know, they can live really productive lives. So the Down syndrome argument, I always go, hang hang on a minute. You know, yeah, it's like, a, why is that an argument? You know, it's it's yeah. there's that you can live with Downs. Down, yeah. you know, you can live a very productive life and have Downs. You can syndrome. end up having a baby and then that person grow up to be incredibly stupid. Well, like, exactly. You can't. What would you? Go, <laughs> you can't yeah, get rid of stupid. <laughs> no, you can't. Get, exactly, exactly. Um, but I, um, what I take issue with at the moment is this idea that abortion has become synonymous with women's liberation. Oh, I like, agree. They're, they're, they're married. Uh, 
yeah, they're married now, and um, it irritates me because if you say, oh, not even if you say I'm pro-life, but oh, I don't know if or how I feel about abortion, you're accused of being a misogynist or anti-women's freedom, and that's how these militant feminists have harnessed this. It's again being behaving badly under the guise of good because it makes it really hard to defend against if you go, oh, I'm not sure about abortion. Oh, well, you're anti-women's freedom then. I mean, how do you defend against that? You have to be nearly a sociopath to be able to actually know. Yeah. But your average normal person is like, well, no, what are you talking about? Um, so I actually think nowadays, it used to be there were two camps. You had pro-life and you had pro-choice. Yeah. I think there are three now. You've got oh. pro-life, pro-choice, and pro-abortion. Um, okay. And, yeah, you've got I, this pro- I, That makes sense to me because I'm so into the subject. All yeah, the yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah, I know. What yeah, pro life, pro life, pro choice, and pro abortion. Clementine Ford is pro abortion, mm -hmm. for instance. I mean, I once, um, so when I was researching my abortion video, and she's made a lot of comments about abortions. Um, I think she has no idea how they happen, and I'll explain how in a minute. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure she's no idea how they work. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's just she posted on that. Well, yeah, no, no. She um, posted on her Facebook page a little a while ago when Queensland um, took abortion out of the penal code um, and said abortion is a method of contraception. And I was like... Yeah, what a dickhead. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Sorry. I mean, yeah. For first of all, contraception implies stopping the conception, co contraception, and, and second of all, I've worked out why they get so angry when you talk about restricting, when people talk about restricting abortion. To them, they believe that it's a method of contraception. So they, to them, having an abortion is the same as taking the pill. Um, so if someone said to me, we're going to remove your means to um, control, to have hormonal contraception, I'd be outraged. Of course, I'd be like, how dare you? You know, because, you know, how, how dare you take that away from me? Um, but that's how they feel about abortion. Um, that's, and that's how I can kind of, how I understand it anyway. But um, Clementine has had two abortions, um, and she's said this a number of times. Like with pride? Yeah, 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 yeah. She's happy to say because she was a little too young and like. No, 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 no. Uh, she was grown it up, um, and she had two abortions because she believes it's a mode of contraception. I that that's what she put in her Facebook anyway. Mm. Um, now I she also when the New York laws went through, um, Ali Beth Stuckey tweeted that. Um, yeah, oh, she's amazing. Yeah, she tweeted something about how New York is going to legalize. It was something like tearing babies, uh, some quite graphic thing, tearing babies, poisoning babies and pulling them out or something like that. And that is how a late-term abortion works. It's a needle to the baby's head and it's a drug called digoxin, I think, and it's designed to stop the baby's heartbeat and then the mother's induced labor and then... And the head is still in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's, they pop it. Well, yeah, and that's that's the other way they do it. So, um, Ali was correct. She was it was she's talking about it in a way that was quite blunt, but she was correct. But Clementine replied to that and said, even if that were true, which it categorically is not, and then blah. And I thought, oh, Clementine, you have no idea how mid or late term abortions work. No, she doesn't. That's when it hit me. I thought okay, she, she probably thinks that all abortions are a little suction out of the first. I think that's what she thinks. The partial. I, I have, Partial birth abortions are vile. Yeah, yeah, they're awful. Um, but and look, so tell me, I, I might be completely wrong on this. But this is my honestly, honestly held opinion for the record. From what I have researched from Clementine, um, and from what she said, I have a feeling she must, in her head, think all abortions are a very simple ten-minute first trimester procedure, um, when the reality is that they're not. So she's talking. Um, without having all of the facts, which I find objectionable, particularly on a topic such as abortion. So in terms of being um, pro-life, um, I, I tend to err on the side of pro-life, but then I find there are there are pro-lifers, for instance, who want to put forward like heartbeat bills, you know, that make it illegal um, when you can detect a heartbeat. Three weeks. I don't, yeah, three weeks, yeah. I don't think that's feasible um, because I'm in a situation, for instance, whereas I, I'm epileptic, for instance. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I take medication twice a day. So if I want to have children, obviously that's going to have to be really, really planned in advance, very heavily monitored. We'll have to possibly experiment with dips and different types of medication. You know, it's going to have to be very, very planned. So if I got accidentally pregnant, my only option would be to have a termination, really, because of the risk factor involved with not having it planned and not regulating the dosage of the medication I'm on, et cetera, et cetera. 
or if say a woman gets diagnosed with cancer very early in the pregnancy and sort of treating her if she has to have you know chemotherapy or something rather um, she couldn't have that with a fetus and then she has a very difficult choice to make do I risk my own life and continue this pregnancy or do I make the other choice and she should have that choice to be able to do that so I can't align myself with the pro-life movement in that sense because sometimes reality strikes um, but in terms of being pro-choice I don't want to call myself that anymore because of the way the pro-choice movement um, presents itself yeah so, so you're in pro-life yeah. but with caveats Yes, that's that's my aha uh -huh movement. I am pro life, but with caveats. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a really. I, think I can agree with that. I think that's reasonable. Oh, good. Thank you. Because yeah. <laughs> I, no, I know you're. I'm hardline, well, this... and I acknowledge yeah. that. Because I, uh, many say to me, "Oh, well, then what about if you were raped?" And I'm like, "Okay, well, I'd keep the baby. Why would I kill it? Like, why would I kill my baby?" I said, "But that baby is not my. Well, not the dad." That baby what? isn't its dad. Like, it's a completely different human being with completely separate DNA. And I'm going to raise that kid to be an awesome person. That child would be a light in my life. Like, mm. like that's, well, I'll, it's I'll just. I'll tell you a story about ahead, that. Um, please do. I, I had this, uh, I had a conversation with a friend of mine um, who has two children and she's pregnant with her third. And um, we were talking about abortion and she's the same as me. Like, she can't even, fat. she's the most maternal person I've ever met in my life. She can't even fathom the thought of doing that um, and she was talking to me about a, a lesbian couple that she knows and one of the girls one of the women was raped and um, conceived um, as a result of this rape and they had a discussion and they went well look you know what we want to have kids we can't have kids on our own we're going to need a, a donor this terrible terrible thing has happened to you but this other thing has also happened as a result of that you've conceived so they it's made the blessing, choice to go kind of yeah yeah they turned what was, what was a really objectively negative situation into a positive and they kept the baby they thought well you know what we're going to make the best of this this has happened this is the situation it's not the baby's fault no um and i i really respect that and i think Same. it's a great way of saying f you to the rapist you know this <laughs> yeah. person you know what i mean they've yeah. violated this woman in the worst possible way a person can be violated um, and tried to take every scrap of dignity away from her and she's gone yeah well you know what stuff you this is what I think and I'm going to raise this child to be a much better man or or person than you ever were so um, yeah the rape issue is a is a tricky one because it's only like one percent of abortions that happen because exactly. of rape and there are mothers who choose to keep their babies when they've been raped because and again I was reading about this um, it's to do with, say, the imagined guilt of being raped, for instance, because there's shame associated with it. If you often, if um, women choose to abort the child, and I remember I was reading this the other day, um, it turns into actual guilt, you know, because something in you must say, well, yeah, this horrible thing happened, but it's not the baby's fault. So I think the question of rape and abortion, I think, is a deeply, deeply, deeply personal decision. Oh, of course, of course. And it depends totally on the woman involved and whether she has a partner and all of that, all of that kind of stuff. Yes. So that's a re that really is a very personal thing and very much a kind of case by case. And I pray to God that I am never fronted with that situation. It would I, just I would be agree with that. Yeah. Horrible. Yes. Um. I think I think the the problem with the whole pro life movement or activism is that people attribute that to someone trying to control the other person's body but really you just want that child to live you, you're, well, you're looking at it from the perspective of, of the of the innocent life that um, has been degraded now to to being a bunch of cells or a parasite according to the change of minds that uh, Stephen Crowder does oh yeah um, it's, it's not a parasite no, it's not a parasite. But the, the, and the thing is, the whole sort of my body, my choice, my body, my choice is totally anti-science because it's not your body. It's another person's body. Mm, you it's an entirely, it, yeah. yeah, it's an entirely separate set of DNA. Yes, you're carrying it inside you. And no, it doesn't have personhood yet in the same way mm. that a birthed human does. But it is alive, indisputably. Mm. It's not a... Like trees are a bunch of cells and they're alive. Do, do you know what I mean? And you've got the same the same people shrieking about um, abortion are the same people who are shrieking about cutting down trees. You, you know what I mean? Vegans. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, vegans, exactly. That's so the cognitive dissonance is moronic. I know it's ex it's extraordinary. Um, it's totally anti science because it's another set of DNA that you just happen to be carrying it. And again, it's this way of um, trying to throw the immorality banner at anyone who opposes you. Um, so they're very, very clever in their rhetoric, the way they can do that. Mm, that's very true. Uh, so regarding um, Australian culture at large, we are a country uh, who is known for, and it's a great thing too, that we work to live. We're laid back, we're, we're chill, you know. Um, however, that is working against us at this current stage because our laid back, um, chilled attitude, um, the laziness, is resulting in what you said before that unlike Americans there is not much of a conservative movement here because not enough people not enough Australians are speaking out you and I are, are, are quite far and few in between doing what we're doing and uh, so that's why so my question is do you think the Australian apathy complacency mm. the Australian culture at large is slightly at fault for what is happening right now because it's being permitted yeah, that's a that's a really good point. I mean, Australians have this thing called tall poppy syndrome, and the Brits the Brits have it as well. And I know you know what it is, but we we very much like to cut down the tall poppies. Whereas, I mean, I lived in America for a while, and it's like totally the opposite. If at least certainly on the east coast, if you're not promoting yourself, then people would think you're an idiot. Like it's a totally <laughs> it's a totally different um, mentality. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Australia Australians. Um, we don't kind of like putting our hands up in the same way that Americans do and you know we're all not we're not happy for other people's success in the same way that Americans are um, and I think that I'm is Spanish it's different oh yeah it's very different um, in, in Europe absolutely but yeah. certainly as Australians are very are very kind of skeptical of other people's success and I think that is um, like it's very frustrating for me and it is um, certainly detrimental to any mo I don't like to use the word mobilizing because it just reminds me of Red Cortez. You know, she talks about organization and, and mobilizing and it's all just communist talk. One of but my videos coming out will be an impersonation of her because she's oh, Latin and I'm Latin. So. <laughs> so you can, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> okay. You're allowed. Oh, that's really funny. I look forward to watching that. That's very good. <laughs> but, um, you know, she does... I don't like using this word. I don't mean mobilize. I mean um, to to facilitate a sort of conservative um, unified dialogue. Sure. You need to have a kind of a confidence and a willingness to say, hey, look at me, let's do this thing. But um, it's not sort of culturally appropriate in Australia to do that. And so we end up kind of chasing our tails a little bit. But yeah, that's what I reckon. I would agree with that. Uh, well, what about in terms of uh, the word feminist? Um, one of my questions that I sent you: Do you would you identify as a feminist if you were living, say, in the 15, 16, 1700s? Would you think that um, you would have been on that bandwagon? That's an interesting. Call it 15, 16, 1700s. Just that's really early. That's an interesting question. Yeah, you know that's really interesting because fem uh, I think I, I would. Know. Well, I don't know if the concept of feminism really existed because back if we're talking about sort of, you know, Britain and Europe, it was very, very much um, dominated by the, Something you know, the, the church, um, oh, yeah. you know, Christianity. And um, that was, they're all very Old Testament back then. And there's a lot, lot of stuff in the Old Testament about, you know, wives submitting to their husband, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone's going to go to hell. It's very, very militant and apocalyptic. It so is. I don't, yeah, yeah, when you go that far back. Um, so... I don't quite know if I would have been able to conceptualize a feminist movement because I'd just be worried about going to hell all the time if I wasn't doing what the church was telling me to do, particularly You're since most people... You're taking it so literally. I, saw, I would just mean... <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. This is my, this is my historical literal mind. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I would have had the, had the conception. I think I would have liked to have been. Um, you know, I would have, I would have liked to have... Um, I mean, if I was a poor person, I could marry who I choose. But even then, you know, not really. I would have liked to marry who I, who I chose. And I would have liked to have not been constantly birthing babies and potentially dying in childbirth. Mm. And I think sort of the 14, 15, 16, 1700s really could have used a feminist movement you know, um, back then. Problem was they were being burned as witches if you were a woman who spoke out a lot of the time. So it was really That's kind of a lose-lose situation yeah. yeah, back then. What about the I, Middle East today? Would you, cons if you were, if you were there, 
and you weren't going to get murdered, would you be mm. a feminist there? Because I often say I'm not a feminist, but if I was in the yeah. Middle East, I probably would be. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. De oh, definitely. I mm. mean, and that's sort of, I think, the great frustration with a lot of, probably most women with modern feminism is that they're perfectly happy to talk about manspreading, but the minute you sort of criticise any Islamic country, they either ignore it or start talking about cultural rel relativism, which is an absolute stain. Um, like Roxanne Gay, remember she was... Uh, Did a couple you go? Of... No, no, I, I couldn't. I, I was loved desperate. it. Yeah. Oh, my God, I was desperate to go, but I couldn't. But she, um, there was this thread on Twitter of a girl who was at, I think, the Sydney show. I think it was the Sydney show. And um, she and Christina were shown this um, video of girls being in Indonesia being told they weren't allowed to go to school because they were dressed immodestly. And Christina of Star Wars Summers immediately said, well, that's objectively misogynistic, you know, you're preventing. And Roxanne Gay, Miss Uber Feminist 2019, um, refused to condemn it and said, well, who are we, the West, to tell these women um, what what they should and shouldn't think is misogynistic? Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. She Here really is bothered me. In, in When I was there, she really bothered me. And, um, and her attitude towards Christina was so off-putting. She was rolling her eyes. Someone asked oh. her a question and said, does your complicity, complicit, oh, my gosh, does you being complicit by sitting on stage with um, Christina Hoff Summers make you guilty by association? And Christina oh. went, oh. and then you can hear me in, in, I think, in the video where I'm going, oh, like, because I couldn't believe she said that. And she was like, no, well, I actually didn't know anything about who even she was. I'm like, bullshit. Any feminist knows Christina Hoff Summers, the legendary. I got to interview her after because I, I, I had my Ooh. camera. Yeah. I'm Good the persistent person. Yeah. Um, wow, yeah. was she nice? I bet she was lovely. She was, she was an honour. I got to hug her. <laughs> oh my gosh, she gets treated like such crap she by does. those awful women. Yeah. Like, yeah, there was there was something with, like, she said Mamma Mia was fat shaming. I'm pretty sure it was her. I'm going to Google it after this because I remember it and going, mm. oh, God, poor Mia Friedman. <laughs> oh. But, um, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, in terms of feminism in the Middle East, yeah, if I was in, in the Middle East, definitely, because I believe in equality of, of the sexes, which is what feminism originally was about. It's just been of kind of Yeah, 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 equality of opportunity. It's just been kind of hijacked and transformed into something it's really not. So if I were in the Middle East, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. yeah. That's cool. Oh, yeah. Well, what's next for you? Like, uh, your, your following um, and your subscribers keeps uh, pushing up and... Uh, you were named the Unshackled uh, Culture what? Warrior of the Year. Culture Warrior of the Year. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you very much. I was very, very pleased. I voted for you, FYI. Thank you. I actually did, yeah. Oh, that's so nice of you. Thank you. Oh, I like I was... you. Oh, thank you. I like you too. No, <laughs> thanks for having me on. You know, I was very, very, very stoked to have won that. I was very chuffed that anyone even voted for me. I put it out to my followers and I'm like, hi, I'm nominated for this thing. And they all like jumped on it and started voting. I was like, oh, that's so nice. Mm. Um, no, I'm really, yeah, I'm really pleased with my following um, and how, how they're growing. I really love my YouTube community. I have nearly 80,000 followers now on YouTube, 80,000 subscribers to I my channel. I have almost 2,000. That's so true. I, if anyone subscribes to me, I'm floored, you know, I'm 2000. I'm so excited, yeah. No, it's good. 2000 is terrific. I remember when I was like at nearly 2000. Um, and it's a, 2000 people is a lot of people. Yeah, well, like it's, it's better a than lot, zero. Yeah, 2000 people is, a, I mean, there's so many tendency to kind of scoff at smaller channels. And I'm like, don't you dare. The fact that like one, two or 3000 people, that's the size of a small town. Mm. You know, if you look at it that way has chosen to click subscribe because they like that that person has influenced them enough to the point where they want to hear what they say is a big thing. So nearly 2,000 is really good. Mm. Congratulations. Thank you. You know, and you'll continue to grow. But, um, yeah, yeah it, I always it, it's growing more and more, which is exciting. Well, the more you get shared, the more you get shared. That's what I find with YouTube. The more people that subscribe to you, the more people that subscribe to you. And that's the kind of double-edged sword about it but it's just a matter you just have to keep on putting out content because yeah. it get it eventually gets shared and the growth if it's good content which yours is then the growth just kind of happens um yeah no so no you, you you'll keep growing but um you know i'm 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 projected and i i my aim is to hit 100k by june 
Ooh. That's my aim. Yeah, so I hope I either June or sometime in June. That's what that's what I'm hoping very much for. Um, but no, my next video is going to come out on Saturday morning because um, generally they come out on Wednesday and Saturday, and it is going to be, believe it or not, a non-political video. Ooh. It's a surprise video, um, which hopefully uh, it's of something that I. It's really very I. I f is very important to me and I really want to talk about and um, you know let people know and kind of raise awareness for so um, I won't tell you what it is you'll have to wait no, until yeah. Saturday I'll share yeah, it on my but, page you'll see. oh great thank you yeah it's a, it's a it's a non-political a non-political and quite nice hopefully thoughtful video so I look I hopefully it'll get a good reaction I'm interested to see what people That's think cool. Uh, just before we wrap up, I was just wanting to know, you obviously, I know you're not a Christian, but what is your opinion on Christianity at large? Do you value the tenets of the faith because Australia was built on it? Oh, no, I believe in God. Um, I would... I thought uh, you were Jewish. Okay, yeah. No, 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 not Jewish. Um, no, I believe in God. I would consider myself a kind of lapsed Catholic. Oh, okay. Very lapsed. Very lapsed Catholic. Very lapsed Catholic. Um, yes, I was not. I was not baptized Catholic. I was baptized Anglican, but I went to Catholic school, gotcha. and I grew up in a very quite non-religious. Well, not non-religious, but just religion wasn't like the way that I grew up. You know, we went to church at Christmas, yeah. um, and that was, and we celebrated Christmas and the Christian holidays, but it wasn't like going to church every Sunday kind of thing. It wasn't the sort of staple of my family life by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but no, um, I think that whatever higher power is out there manifests itself to different people in different ways. Um, you know, whether that's through um, Christianity or Judaism or, or Buddhism or, you know, anything, Taoism or, you know, yeah. anything like that manifests itself to different people in different ways. I think, um, Chris, I mean, Christianity, like any, any religion has its flaws, but ultimately mm. the Christianity is um, basically about not being a jerk. That was Jesus' whole thing was, guys, just don't be a dick, man. But you know what I mean? It was, it was about, you know, to yeah, tolerance I, I and mercy. I remember that Bible verse. I think it's somewhere in, in, in Yeah, Matthew. In, in Matthew chapter something or other. But that's, you know, what's about <laughs> it's, it's, What I like about Christianity is that it its central tenet, at least to me, is love one another. Mm, um, love and love, neighbor, one, love one another. Yeah, lo love one another. Um, and I think that's um, a wonderful way to live your life, you know, love one another, you know, love your enemy, turn the other cheek, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, there are some aspects of Christianity that are a bit apocalyptic, which I don't like. I don't like anything that's apocalyptic. But in uh, terms of, uh, yeah, yeah. It's depressing. Not a lot of, it is depressing and a lot, not a lot of Christians do like anything that's apocalyptic. I've noticed that it's only the kind of fundamentalist branches who sort of buy into that. But, um, oh, I believe I, it. I am Christian enough to believe it, but I find it depressing. It scares me. Hence, I don't oh, like it. Oh, I feel So I'm mean. slightly yeah, yeah. different to you in that regard. But that's fine. Yeah, we're allowed. Yeah, no, no, I know what you mean. No, that's yeah. that's no, I get what you mean. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, be, I don't believe in hell. Sure. Um, for instance, that's you know, that's my reading of it. Sure. Um, but I, I see the good that Christianity has done. Um, in particularly throughout modern history, in turn, they, they were they messed up a bit in the Middle Ages with the selling of. People, that was bad. Mm. Oh, that was the bad, bad decision by the Pretty Catholic evil. Church. Very evil. Um, but in terms of, you think of how many global charities are Christianity based, for instance. Mm. Like it's, it, it, it's, name me a specifically atheist charity. We are atheists and we are putting together a charity. They don't exist. I don't you know, think they you do. Have, and if they do, no, they don't. don't. There's, the odd, there's the odd kind of secular charity out there, but there aren't many of them and they're not kind of self-consciously, we are atheists. You think of all the Christian charities, that says something about Christianity, I think. It does. That all, like, you know, all of those big global, like Anglicare and, you know, the Salvation Army and World Vision, I think Tear Fund as well, which is, you know, human trafficking, um, they're all based um, on Christianity. Yeah. So I see the good, the, the good tenets of Christianity do. I see the purpose it gives people. I see how it brings people together. Um, I don't like the anti-gay stuff um, in a lot of Christian churches. I object to that very much. Um, but generally, um, I think Christianity um, is a very good way to collect, you know, as opposed to being part of collectivism and to form communities and to 
give you purpose and to inspire you to do good and to love one another. Yes. So that's my opinion of Christianity. Oh, that's cool. I'll finish up on this last question, which is, what is your view of the internet censorship and Article 13, which has just been unleashed in Europe, and do you think it will eventually affect us here in Australia? Yeah, that's, that's, an, interesting, that's an interesting one. I've kept a little bit of an eye on Article 13. Um, I don't know the intricate details, but I do think that... Um, any kind of bureaucratic barrier, which is sort of what this is to creating content, is ultimately going to um, cause everything to go down the toilet eventually. You know, the more the more you interfere, um, the harder it becomes. And you know, at, like with copyright at the copyright at the moment, okay, you know, you you put material up, somebody makes a claim, you have an argument about it, and then you either take the material down or you get sued. Um, but having and and that's the market kind of working everything out. You know the kinks do get worked out. But trying to put a kind of restriction on that before content even goes out, um, well, that's just not feasible. You know what I mean? It's 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 just going to create um, problems with the, in with creativity. You know people aren't going to be as original. They're going to be much more cautious when putting out stuff when they don't sort of need to be and ultimately it strangles creativity. Mm. Um, as to whether it comes here, I really hope it doesn't. Yeah. I don't think our internet is quite so dense as it is in Europe because there's just more people living there. Mm. Um, so I hope not, but if it does, hopefully not soon. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um... Yeah, well, there is blockchain technology that's being developed, so something newer than the internet, and then there's cryptocurrency. So there's always a workaround, which I think is yeah. is positive. So we'll probably just end up doing that. <laughs> probably, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Well, um, thank you so much, uh, Daisy Cousins, for coming on my show. I really appreciate it, and um, it's been an honor speaking to a fellow conservative, an, an Aussie Australian yeah. <laughs> female conservative. So it's all really, really good, and... Um, I hope we run into each other one day. I will be at the Freedman Conference, but I'll be yes. there on Saturday and Sunday. I don't know when you'll be there. Mm, I don't. I'll try and be there for as much of it as possible. So hopefully, I will see you on Saturday and or Sunday at Freedman. That would be good. Thank you very much for having me. This was a lot of fun. It's a Thank lot of fun. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. No worries. I'll speak to you soon. Cool. <laughs>